sure climate change will lead to the sea level rise, flooding, and additional impacts that can have a negative impact on sensitive watershed and vulnerable uh, populations, including groups with limited economic resources, access to health care, and lower quality housing stock in susceptible populations. Due to sea level rise and additional flooding, individuals who live near environmental hazards and locally unwanted land uses in the eastern shore may have a higher risk of exposure to chemical and microbial contaminants. In their well water or through fishing, recreational or participation in other bay-related activities, these impacts can happen. The disproportionate impacts of climate change in this region can lead to environmental injustice and environmental health disparities for already underserved resource and marginalized populations and communities. In this session, presenters will discuss ways to make rural communities, particularly underserved communities in the Eastern Shore, more resilient to climate change. And the human health implications of this work, they will discuss their research efforts to understand socioeconomic, geographic, and ecological vulnerabilities in the Eastern region, and how these vulnerable vulnerabilities present challenges in improving resiliency in the Eastern Shore. The panelists will describe community engagement and education efforts as a part of their work with diverse stakeholders on the issue of climate resiliency. And they will also, um, to the extent of their knowledge, discuss what policies have been implemented to improve climate, climate resiliency and the effectiveness of these programs. Um, so with that, our first presenter, Our first presenter will be Frederick Moser, who is the director of the Maryland Seed Grant here at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Um, the Maryland Seed Grant mission is to support research, education, and outreach on the marine and coastal issues of importance to Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay. Frederick is a member of the Northeastern Regional Aquaculture Center Board and on the advisory board of the Institute for Broadening Participation. She was a member of the Board of Directors for the Mid-Atlantic Regional Association Coastal Ocean Observing Systems and served as a consultant for the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy. Prior to her appointment as director, Frederica worked as the, which the Maryland Sea Grants um, Assistant Director for Research. And from 1999 to 2001, she was a AAAS Fellow with the U.S. Department of State's Bureau on Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. In that position, she um, participated in international negotiations, negotiations on marine science policy issues. Prior to her fellowship, she had a postdoctoral position, which was at the Bermuda Institute for Ocean Sciences, where she focused on ocean and human health issues and benthic ecology. Before pursuing her PhD at Rutgers Institute of Marine Coastal Science in New Jersey, Person. Frederica has spent six years as a manager at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, so did I, um, focusing on coastal and marine issues at the interface of science, law, and policy. Frederica Mosa received her BS in Earth Science and a BA in Environmental Studies from the University of California at Santa Cruz, and a Master of Science and a PhD degree from, the, from Rutgers University in New Jersey. So with a warm welcome, to present our first Uh, two years ago, I missed last year's. Uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, 
opportunity for people to uh, get together and really talk about issues. And I was very excited when Sokovi was uh, decided to have a big uh, focus on the Chesapeake Bay this time. So my talk today is not really going to touch on the, it's going to bring us up to why we're concerned about resilient communities. And then uh, Christy and Jan are really going to talk about the community's work that they've been doing in, on the Eastern Shore. Um, I thought what was important was for us to be clear and talk about the science behind climate change. If we're going to have informative um, discussions and help communities vision where they're going to go under these changing landscapes that they're going to be experiencing in the next um, decades, uh, I think it's really important that we're comfortable and we feel um, that we can talk about the science, and I think that's been challenging, and I don't think we should back away from it. Um, the science is solid. There isn't any question about it. Climate is changing. I know. I assume I'm preaching to the audience, you know, to the the knowledgeable ones. But um, but I, it, it's pretty important. Let me just tell you a little bit about Maryland Sea Grant, and then I'll talk a little bit about climate change uh, globally and sea level rise specifically in uh, the Chesapeake Bay because it varies regionally from mean global sea level rise numbers. And then uh, I'll just set up the community resilience for the next speakers. So um, Maryland Sea Grant is a congressionally funded program and it's administered through NOAA. Uh, we are, uh, there are 34 Sea Grant college programs based in Great Lakes and coastal states in the United States as well as Puerto Rico and Guam. Uh, it is a science first program um, we really believe that uh, science is critical for informing sound policy decisions and looking for policy and behavior change uh, with a solid science uh, underpinning. Uh, we have an extension component, um, which uh, is a uh, arm of all Sea Grant programs that uh, increase our ability to work with communities and, and where our focus for working on uh, community resilience holds for. And our, um, our, our basic uh, mission is to uh, support research, education, and outreach. So we have a governance board. This is just to tell you a little bit of where we sit. So here's Sea Grant. Um, we are administered by the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Uh, our our um, extension folks are housed within the University of Maryland College Park University of Maryland Extension Program. We sit under a governance board of the University System of Maryland and our efforts are to, um, and, and we um, work to serve all the academic and research institutions within the state of, of Maryland. Um, we have guidance that we get from an external advisory board made up, made up of stakeholders and our academic advisory council. So the important thing is that Maryland Sea Grant, we really respect that we're a congressionally funded program, and our job is to serve all the constituents of the state of Maryland, and we take that uh, very seriously. So what do we do? We really support transformative science through our research uh, granting program, and that's promoting marine, coastal, and watershed shed knowledge. So for us in Maryland, that's really the Chesapeake and the coastal bays and their watersheds, and that's that's a focus for our program. Um, our goal is to listen and engage and respond to multiple audiences. Um, we look to educate a diversity of students. We have programs that serve formal and informal education, reaching K through 12 students through undergraduate and graduate students. Um, and we look to inform many different audiences. We pride ourselves, and we think our niche in Maryland is important to reach across boundaries. And those boundaries can be governance boundaries, they can be stakeholder boundaries, uh, they can be geographical boundaries. Um, and we like to interact with many partners. We think that our work and facilitation and synthesis of science to inform and help change uh, policy and behavior is an important part of our role. So we've got uh, quite a good capacity, I think, in what we do. We have a we support research, we have a strong communications group, we have an extension component education in our administration, and we look at portfolios of, of problems, and sea level rise and climate is certainly a big one, um, and we support through our uh, capacity actionable science, and we look to engage communities in uh, an <coughs> effort to um, affect change. 
So um, our interest in climate change, um, you know, I've left two things here. If anybody wants to pick them up, we've got our annual report from 2013, so that's getting a little tired. But, um, and we also, I'm very excited to say we have just put out a um, double issue in a uh, collaborative project with the Bay Journal on um, sea level rise. And we have a, uh, our magazine, which you're held, uh, happy to take with you, and we also have a um, complimentary website that we developed for it that's an interactive website. And so I encourage you to, to, to Google that or go to Maryland Sea Grant, help yourself to one of the magazines if you're interested in taking them. Uh, we also have been supporting climate change research. Um, we've been looking at um, marsh responses, in particular Phragmites and Bayesian to increasing CO2 levels. We're working in the coastal bays in a regional project supported by Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia Sea Grants, looking at uh, submerged aquatic vegetation's responses to rising sea levels as well as other conditions in the coastal bays. And we also are supporting, um, now it will be our second um, climate change community engagement forum, and that will be happening in a, in a couple of months, so look forward to that, and then engaging in the communities. So I'm now going to shift, now that you know sort of what we're doing, let's shift a little bit more to the, the purpose of all of this, which is really talking for us about climate change and then what that means to communities in on the eastern shore and in, in the region. So, um, so this adage, you guys probably have heard this, you know, climate is what you expect. And so, um, you know, we expect the seasons, we expect things to be happening. We also are seeing, as shown here, the uh, effects of climate change happening now in uh, the melting of sea ice in particular in the polar regions. Um, but Confounding this is weather, which is what you get. So you expect climate, but you get weather. And one of the challenges of that is that it allows us to have sort of misunderstandings or misinterpretations and doubting of the um, overall effects of climate change. Because as shown here, you get a lot of snow in Buffalo in uh, early, in late November. How can climate? How can the temperatures be warming if we're experiencing these? Uh, this big snowfall or any other number of examples that I'm sure you all are aware of. So, um, but we know in fact that um, that the climate is uh, changing and the climate is changing uh, primarily due to the emission of greenhouse gases. And what I've shown here is this is a little bit of an old graph but it's by the Woodsward Hole Research Center but I think it's a really nice uh, illustration. And so the blue squiggly lines, that's uh, global temperatures. The dates run from 1880 and here to 2010, even though, uh, and the CO2 concentrations are to 2006. And so the yellow line, for those of you who don't know, those are atmospheric measurements and the, uh, of CO2 emissions on parts per million. And the concentrations are CO2 are here, and temperature in Fahrenheit is on the, the right-hand um, y-axis. And um, and the, the red line here is um, estimates of CO2 uh, concentrations in the atmosphere based on ice cores. Um, and so what you can see is um, that we have certainly been increasing the rate of change of both um, temperature and the emissions of CO2. Um, we are on track right now for um, 2014 being the uh, hottest, warmest um, global temperatures that were recorded, um, and our CO2 emissions are up to 396 parts per million as of October. Um, so uh, pretty scary how quickly we went from 350, which seemed only like yesterday, uh, like a year ago, and now we're hitting 400. So the rate of change is really increasing. Okay, so um, if you're going to warm up the world, what you're going to end up doing here is um, uh, we're going to melt ice. So that's the top uh, diagram up there. We're going to melt ice and we're going to, to um, increase uh, the temperature of the oceans. And that's a big global uh, contribution. So the diagram here, which is from um, the report that, that we um, had a piece of, of uh, um, uh, a bit of the, a piece of the communications component of it in 2013. Uh, as part of, the, of Governor O'Malley's uh, climate change um, climate change commission, 
the uh, his scientific and technical working group was asked to come up with projections of sea level rise for um, of sea level rise for Maryland in over the next until 2100. And so that commission came together, and we uh, out of that um, the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences uh, wrote a great report. This is from that report. I really urge you to look at it. And we made a nine-minute video which really explains climate change. And that's where a lot of this talk is based on that. So the point of this diagram is that these are sort of, there are regional effects for sea level rise and there are global effects. And I'll go into some detail on that now. Okay, so global response to sea level, that's primarily melting ice caps, melting some other glaciers, and thermal expansion of the oceans. Um, other responses are basically, we're expecting wetter wets, drier dries, and uh, more intense tropical cyclones. So what's driving sea level rise? I'm gonna show a series of these uh, pictures and they're gonna be sort of similar in that these are from the report I just mentioned that was done for the uh, climate, Maryland's Climate Commission. Um, these, what these show, uh, and the details are really important, but it's the different components of sea level rise uh, that we consider when we're coming up with projections of Maryland, uh, what Maryland, what Maryland is expecting for sea level rise. And then I usually have a little picture to the side illustrating whichever topic I'm talking about. This happens to be thermal expansion. You heat, heat up the globe, you heat up the water of the oceans, heated water expands, and you get sea level rise from that. All right, the next thing that I'm looking talked about is, is ice melting. And um, so the, the, the big kahuna in the room with ice melting is uh, continental ice melting. And so that will be from the polar region, so Greenland and then Antarctica. Um, there's a recent paper that came out that says that the West Antarctic ice sheet, which has been beginning to melt, is now uh, melting uh, at a rate that uh, was much higher than we thought it would be. So that's pretty worrisome. Uh, and they contribute differently to different um, regional components of sea level rise in the oceans. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the graph over here just simply shows the different contributions of the polar ice sheet melting from Antarctica in the lightest blue, and then Greenland in uh, a darker blue, and then glacial melt and then thermal expansion. You can see the, the components of that. So really, Antarctica and thermal expansion are what's really affecting global so now let's go to regional sea level rise. Let's bring it back home. That's what this uh, workshop's all about, or this uh, symposium is all about. And we're going to bring it down to talking about mid-Atlantic, and I'll use the Maryland as the mid-Atlantic, but these changes are going on throughout the mid-Atlantic. And so regionally, you get on top of this global uh, sea level rise numbers, rates of rise, you get regional differences. And right now, the mid-Atlantic exceeds global um, uh, sea level rise averages. And some of this is due to changes in ocean currents, vertical land movements, and gravitational change at a high latitudes due to ice melting, and a little bit to the, ch and to a degree, especially when it comes to storm surge, the sort of configuration of the Chesapeake Bay. So, Ocean currents, um, in particular for the mid-Atlantic, we have that Gulf Stream running up um, off of our coast. And um, as the Gulf Stream, so the pictures that I've got here is the Gulf Stream, it meanders and it speeds up and it slows down. And if you can imagine this current running up the side of the coast and it's being pulled off to the right by the Coriolis of Effect. And in order for it to, to um, sort of stay continuous, it tilts a little bit. It's a big, wide piece of water. And it actually has a meet, about a meter difference in height between the, the seaward side of the stream and the landward side of the Gulf Stream. And as it can slow down, the Coriolis effect will have less pull on it. And it will actually start to lose some of that tilt. And when it does that, think of the land here you're now letting more water basically slosh up onto the, the, the coastline. And so as the, as the Gulf Stream goes slows and, and increases its rate, you see an effect here. So the gray is this speeding up and slowing down of the, of the, um, 
or the change in the level, okay, sorry, it's really the change in the level of the, of the, of the height of the, of the Gulf Stream. And so as it slows down and speeds up, that height changes. And so these, the blue, the other three colors are Baltimore, Annapolis, and Solomon's Island. And so what you can see recently that we've looked at that's been documented through um, high gauge measurements is that and then altimeter readings, uh, satellite readings of, of the Gulf Stream, is that we've seen this real change in uh, the level of, of, um, of the tilt and the, the height of the Gulf Stream. And corresponding to that or uh, related to that has been a change in the height of the of the, of the um, water in these locations. And so um, there's uh, quite a bit of speculation and concern now about how that's being affected, uh, the speed of the Gulf Stream on the um, <coughs> climate change. Um, another one is sinking land. Um, the Maryland used to be, there was big glacial, big ice sheets that used to cover uh, continental United States and thousands of years ago and as those melted uh, basically you get a rebounding of the land and so is the and we happen to be on so think of sort of a teeter-totter and if this is sort of Maryland's end you used to have the ice was sitting here weighing it down now all the ice is melted very slowly to get a rebound and what happens is that we're getting more tilt down at our end and so that it contributes to sea level rise increasing regionally in our area. Also components of groundwater which pulls water out of the ground. Sediments tend to compact because there isn't water in between the spaces and that also will contribute to sinking land. So where this led the, um, the technical working group ultimately was to come up with these projections of um, sea level rise and so the the numbers in red are our best guesses for uh, 2015 and 2100, and we've got uh, first in meters and feet. And so you can see, and then we have a low and a high range for both of those, and so you can see that at the very high end, the speculation of up to six feet, and on the um, low end of maybe only, uh, you know, a, f um, a uh, foot of change or less in, uh, by 2050. Um, these are hard numbers to come up with because of a lot of those regional influences and in particular because we don't know what the rate of emissions of CO2 are going to be into the atmosphere over the next 30 years and whether we will be able to mitigate and reduce those inputs. So this is a wonderful tool that I um, hope you guys have are aware of. It's uh, called Surging Seas and it's on Climate Central's website. You can also find it on our uh, website about sea level rise. And they have a fun tool um, where you can take and you just type in a zip code and or get zip code and it will take you to that zip code and it will show you what changes in sea level um, may occur at that area. And so I've just done a big one here of the Chesapeake Bay, so you don't can't really see much detail. But so we showed pictures here of one foot, three feet, and five feet is which is basically the range I just talked about. So if you look in places around Easton, this is fairly dramatic. You can as you look across these three, you can see that the gray, which represents land above water, begins to retreat further and further and you can see the same thing when you're looking down the Del Marva Peninsula as it narrows considerably. So that's what we have to look for. So the point here is it's real and there are communities along the eastern shore that are really going to be affected by this and how are we going to engage those communities effectively so they can prepare for this, uh, these changes. So the other thing to bring up here is that so we've talked a lot about sea level rise. One of the other sort of secondary components of sea level rise is what happens when you have a storm event. And if you've got slightly deeper water and you have a storm event, you will have the effects of storm surge. Now storm surge really does begin to vary considerably throughout the bay because it can be, um, because it is affected a lot by changes in wind speed and velocity, uh, wind speed and direction of the storm, um, pressure differences, 
and uh, sort of the geography of the Chesapeake Bay. So as an example for Hurricane Isabel in 2003, Annapolis experienced a tremendous amount of flooding. Yet during, yet during Superstorm Sandy, the community that was severely affected in Maryland was Crisfield. And again, these really are events that are going to be happening, but it will be hard to predict which community is going to suffer um, severely in a given storm because of all these different conditions that can exist for storms. And part of the science is trying to understand and forecast better those nuances of a given storm and try and pinpoint what communities will be most effective so we can, can respond uh, most quickly to them. So, um, the other things we just need to think about is um, increased precipitation intensity. And um, I don't know if you guys have seen this from the National Climate Assessment. It's a pretty nice little graph. It's um, it got a lot of press. It's What it's showing here is the change in precipitation of the most extreme 1% event in a given year. Okay, So it's that event where it's really raining cats and dogs. And so what they've done here is they looked at change of those 1% events from 1958 up through 2012. And what you can see is the Mid-Atlantic and um, New England are, have had a huge change in the amount of precipitation that occurs in those 1% events. So, you know, I said that thing, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. If you've been noticing, like I have over the last decade, like, wow, you know, it really like rains hard around here, and I don't remember my house flooding so much all the time. Turns out, that's because it is. Um, so, you know, this in a much broader context, I look at this and I also think about, I think about communities and I think about what's the United States going to do as we move ahead with these climate change questions. And I say, you know, um, there are going to be very hard decisions made about who's, what communities are going to be protected and which ones aren't. And I look at this and I say, you know, is uh, Iowa going, is Ohio going to care to spend money to save Miami or, or New York City? And is Maryland going to want to ship water to Iowa? So I'm wrapping up here now with the community resilience. Um, Maryland Sea Grant's engagement here um, had, is growing, and we would like to grow it more in our engagement with communities. I've told you we're supporting research. We have a request for proposals out now for a, a regional um, study from including Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey. And that focus of that is to look at com coastal communities and uh, their response as well as the science behind uh, what we need to be thinking about for adaptation. So if you're interested in uh, being part of a, a, a proposal um, to submit to us, um, see me and talk to your colleagues. Uh, we've worked, as you can see, we're working hard at increasing our communication tools to talk about sea level rise. And um, our real interest now is to partner with communities in a collaborative learning process where we can begin discussing adaptations um, to changing landscapes. Um, I think we owe it to the communities of the United States and the world to begin these discussions. And there are many, many communities, and there are not enough of us to have those discussions. But um, America is an incredibly resilient country. We, uh, we love the fact that we're innovative and that we're survivors, and that we, uh, you know, it's our we have a can-do attitude, um, and we're going to need a can-do attitude. And um, Maryland Sea Grant and our extension agents are really committed to working with communities uh, across the different levels of governance and community needs and economics to start having these kind of discussions so that people can really uh, prepare for uh, and adapt to these changes. So again, I encourage you to uh, check out our uh, a couple of these uh, publications, the, the Come High Water, and then also our nine-minute video on uh, forecasting sea level rise from Maryland. So thank you, and I'm going to turn it over to the real community folks. We have Christine Miller-Hessen, 
who is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Maryland College Park. As a part of her EPA Star Fellowship, Christine is um, performing a study entitled Social, Ecological, Resilience, and Adaptation on the Eastern Shore of the Chesapeake Bay. She's using ethnographic methods, which including interviews, workshops, and surveys, which will be used to research how communities in the Eastern Shore have experienced and adapted to flooding in the past and how they anticipate coping with flooding related to sea level rise in the future. In addition, regional scientists and policymakers will be interviewed and surveyed to analyze the degree to which these different stakeholder groups share knowledge and perspectives on vulnerability and possibilities for the su successful adaptation of the social ecological system. Throughout the research, the presence of key resilience factors will be assessed, which include living with uncertainty, nurturing diversity, combining different types of knowledge and creating opportunities for self-organization. It is expected that her research will yield methods for operationalizing and assessing the presence of factors of resilience in social ecological systems, as well as further understanding on the relationship between vulnerability, adaptation, and resilience. In addition, it is anticipated that her research will result in transdisciplinary and transcultural learning between stakeholder groups and reveal areas in which under, underrepresented communities, especially environmental justice communities, can engage in policy and the policy process. So, that, this is not your Sorry. volume gets too low, someone in the back just wave and let me know and I'll speak up. Um, so good morning. It's good to be here. Um, I'll be talking about uh, my dissertation research and I'm looking forward to the discussion at the end of this session. So as um, Frederica was talking about, the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay is uh, the fourth largest region vulnerable to sea level rise along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. Uh, while sea level in this region has risen 30 centimeters over the last century, it's predicted to rise another 110 centimeters this century, which will cause the bay shorelines um, right through here to retreat by um, 5 to 10 kilometers. And many communities and individuals are vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise. Um, however, environmental injustices uh, such as unequal access to adaptation resources and decision-making processes uh, make African-American communities along the eastern shore particularly vulnerable to sea level rise. Uh, sea level rise on Maryland's eastern shore is caused by both climate change and subsidence or the land sinking as Frederica talked about. Um, and both of these processes can be thought of as uh, natural processes. However, flooding from sea level rise is an environmental justice issue for several reasons. Uh, first, not all people are equally responsible for causing climate change. In the United States, African Americans are less responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, both historically and at present. Uh, in 2004, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Center for Policy Analysis and Research estimated that African-American households emit 14% less greenhouse gases uh, directly from fuel use, and if you measure indirect emissions um, from purchases, it's 36% less. Furthermore, African-Americans that are living in rural areas have the lowest carbon footprint of any other uh, group in the United States, emitting 23% less than the national average. Many of the flood-prone African-American communities along the eastern shore have been classified as rural according to the uh, most recent census. And so these are communities that are among those least responsible for causing the climate change and sea level rise that will affect them. A second reason uh, that this is an environmental justice issue is that not all people are going to be equally vulnerable to the impacts of flooding. Historical and cultural legacies of discrimination and inequality have limited these African-American communities' access to 
to resources <laughs> and their ability to participate in decision making about how resources are going to be used. Uh, many of the African American communities existing on the Eastern Shore today were established following the Civil War and the end of slavery and as newly freed slaves during a time of intense racial discrimination. The community founders had few resources with which to acquire land and ended up on the most marginalized and blood-prone areas. But nevertheless, these communities have persisted and they've passed property down to descendants over many generations such that current homeowners in these communities can directly trace their ancestry back to the community founders. Finally, uh, flooding from sea level rise is an environmental justice issue because not all people are able to equally participate in the processes by which allocation of adaptation resources are going to be distributed. Often the most vulnerable groups and communities, such as the rural African American communities already described, have the least power to influence decision makers. So that means that those that are the most vulnerable to climate change impacts may very likely be overlooked or left out when adaptation resources So in the fall of 2012, I and my advisor, Michael Paliso, who's in the Department of Anthropology here, uh, we began a research project to look at obstacles and opportunities that are facing African American communities uh, and their risk to flooding from sea level rise. Uh, because these communities on the Eastern Shore have historically been organized around United Methodist churches, we began by using GIS mapping to identify those church communities that were most at risk to flooding from sea level rise. Um, so here the churches are mapped. These are the African American United Methodist churches, and uh, the United Methodist denomination is the most uh, common one among these African American communities on the Eastern Shore. So these red churches here would be inundated with a zero to two foot rise in sea level. Orange churches with a two to five foot rise in sea level, yellow with a five to 10 foot rise, and then green are on relatively higher ground. Uh, as Frederica mentioned, the best prediction in this area is that by 2100, we'll see 3.7 feet of sea level rise. So these red churches will be inundated and likely some of the orange one is, ones as well. In the meantime, these areas are going to have uh, increased magnitude and duration of storm surge flooding that comes periodically. Um, so we spent several months identifying these communities to learn more about the role of social and ecological factors in their flood vulnerability. And then <clears throat> we selected three on which to focus our study. Um, St. Michael's up here in Talbot County, uh, then four very small communities in Dorchester County. Uh, this is Smithville, Aries, Fork Neck, and Liners Road. And uh, those church communities often worship together and fellowship together. So we're considering them one community for the study. And then down here, this is Chris Field in Somerset County. We found um, that these communities actually had some surprising sources of resilience. And resilience can be defined as the ability to persist and thrive in the face of a disturbance. In each of the three communities in which we held workshops and conducted interviews, we found no resistance to the idea that climate change was happening or that sea level rise was happening. Rather, the communities were keenly aware of the changes taking place around them. And in all three communities, workshop participants had a great deal of knowledge about the flooding of their local roads and were able to specifically identify what parts of those roads flooded, the conditions under which they flooded, and the typical magnitude and duration of the flood. Uh, participants in all communities also discussed areas of poor drainage and could specify whether flooding of a particular area was from precipitation or uh, tidal water. 
In addition, participants could describe how flooding had changed over their lifetimes. In St. Michael's, one participant explained the greater extent of flooding, saying that the floodwaters now come all the way into town, well, they didn't used to. In Dorchester County, an interviewee talked about how the water was much closer to the woods than it used to be. She remembered being able to run across um, a huge expanse of open ground that was now permanently inundated. And then in Crisfield, um, where they had Hurricane Sandy in 2012, they commented that every storm seems to be getting worse. Community members also had a collective memory about how the community had coped with flooding in the past. Interviewees described how the church would help facilitate resources and distribute them to those who have the greatest need. And they also talked about how they learned what to do during and after a flood from their parents and from their grandparents. A few generations ago, these communities were both politically and physically isolated from the rest of the Eastern Shore, yet by working together, they were able to successfully cope with the flooding that came their way. They were um, greatly resilient to flooding. Unfortunately, um, unlike in the past, today it is more difficult for these communities to be self-reliant during and after a flood. Uh, with the crash of the seafood industry, many uh, people who, of working age had to move elsewhere in search of jobs. And this outmigration resulted in uh, a smaller population size in these historic African American communities, and also a greater number of elderly people. And this diminishing size and increasing age of these communities makes it difficult for them to take care of each other during a flooding event as they were able to in the past. Uh, of course, now there is state and federal flood assistance available that wasn't available in the past. However, political and physical isolation of uh, these communities continues such that they have difficulty in uh, accessing these resources and accessing participation uh, processes by which they might uh, negotiate more resources for their community. Um, we did an exercise at one of the workshops called a pile sort, and I can explain that later if people are interested. But this exercise revealed that, in general, these communities are thinking of the things that make them sensitive or most vulnerable to flooding to be localized in the community, and the things that would help them adapt or recover from flooding to be external, to be more at the, the state level or the federal level. And they talked about frustration in figuring out how to access those resources. So there's a gap there that is undermining that resilience. And then they also talked about fearing a loss of their history and heritage with the diminished size of the communities and the looming threat of increased flooding. Procedural and distributive injustices on the eastern shore served to further decrease the resilience of these communities. Uh, procedural justice considers who gets to be included in decision-making processes, and distributive justice considers how fairly things are distributed. And in my research, I've been considering um, both the negative impacts of flooding, how those are distributed, as well as uh, adaptive capacities, or the good the resources that can help ameliorate the effects of flooding. So this spring, uh, Michael and I began, Michael, my advisor, began planning for a workshop that would bring together policymakers, leaders of environmental organizations, and uh, representatives from African American church communities. And we had three goals, to introduce our project and describe key findings, to create a space for individuals with diverse backgrounds to come together and discuss justice and adaptation, and to develop recommendations for increasing justice as Eastern Shore prepares for and responds to flooding. The workshop took place in July at the Blackwater National Wildlife uh, Center Visitor Center, and 27 people participated including uh, nine representatives from African-American church communities, 
seven policymakers, five representatives of environmental organizations, uh, one representative of the regional United Methodist Church, and then there were two anthropology graduate students and three workshop facilitators. So of the 27 participants, uh, 12 were African American and 15 Anglo American. And the morning session included a time where we heard from representatives from each of our stakeholder groups about what justice meant to them in their community or in their work. And then I also presented some of the key findings from my research. In the afternoon, we broke participants into small groups uh, to come up with the main obstacles facing the Eastern Shore in increasing justice toward uh, adaptation to sea level rise and also the main opportunities. Uh, participants identified numerous obstacles and many were interconnected, but overall they fell into seven main categories. Uh, many of the communities at risk of flooding lack the monetary resources to adequately prepare for and recover from a flood event. And workshop participants discussed how disparity of resources unfairly increases the vulnerability of African American communities. Uh, while flood preparation and recovery funding is distributed to counties by the state, African American community members often face <coughs> obstacles in accessing those resources. A second, lack of information about approaching floods and evacuation plans increases the vulnerability of these communities. And workshop participants who had experienced flooding uh, told stories about how some in the community uh, who maybe had more access to planners knew far in advance what they needed to do and how to get out while others were left out of the, the loop of information. Uh, third, lack of collaboration both across different levels of government and between government and non-government agencies as well as between uh, different uh, classes and cultural groups within communities increases the vulnerability uh, of the communities to funding. Limited adaptation resources are less effectively employed when government agencies at different levels don't collaborate and there are opportunities for collaboration between organizations that focus primarily on environmental adaptation to expand their goals so that human well-being can also be incorporated. Uh, fourth, lack of transparency in the way resources are distributed, as well as lack of clarity about regulations and variances hampers the ability of communities to pursue funding and regulatory exceptions that would increase their resilience. Uh, at the workshop, African American community members discussed the frustration they felt when funding was denied without explanation. And they also described the hardship that critical area laws uh, meant to protect wetlands and other natural bodies along the eastern shore. Uh, with the, the constraints they placed on the community. For example, in some of the communities, uh, the churches, these historic churches have lost land to the um, encroaching wetlands. And they may be eligible for variances, but the technical language makes it difficult for them to navigate how to pursue that opportunity. Uh, fifth, and one of the largest obstacles, is a relative lack of representation in government and non-governmental organizations. And when these um, communities are not represented in those organizations, then these issues of environmental injustice can be overlooked or become invisible. So this is another big obstacle. Uh, two more, and I'll wrap things up. Uh, lack of understanding and information about the serious of sea level rise and increased inundation and storm surges. Uh, this causes communities to be less proactive in planning than they might be otherwise. And the use of jargon in both government and non-governmental agencies often makes information inaccessible or confusing. And then finally, uh, because of historic settlement patterns during times of increased racial discrimination, many of these communities are located in areas that have been subject to flooding for generations. So they have an acute 
accumulated wealth of knowledge about how to respond to flooding in their local setting. Uh, so there's a need here for there to be more um, collaboration between the, the local experiential knowledge and then the, uh, the higher levels, the more technical scientific knowledge, for those to be integrated so there can be more effective uh, local adaptation. also identified some opportunities. I'm just going to very briefly highlight those. Um, many emphasize the need for government and non-government agencies to increase their engagement with African American community members. And local African American churches were identified as key organizations that could facilitate greater dialogue, understanding, and collaboration. And so then to summarize my main points. Uh, first, climate change is an environmental justice issue because those that have been least responsible for causing climate change are going to face the greatest vulnerability to its impacts. Second, despite being vulnerable, it's very important to remember that these rural African American communities have shown surprising resilience in the face of flooding in the past. However, demographic changes and out-migration have undermined that resilience. And finally, and most importantly, a distributive and procedural injustice to further undermine African-American resilience on the Eastern Shore. And so efforts need to be made to increase justice for these communities so they can be more resilient in the face of sea level rise as well as other
we translate the science for communities and then we go out to the communities that we live and work in and provide these technical resources to people to help improve their quality of life, their environment, or their business. Um, we are an unbiased source of information, so we don't advocate, we don't lobby, we don't help one business over another, we don't help one community over another. We work in every community that we can, and we're always trying to improve our efforts at diversity and inclusion. Um, we are a sustained presence in the community, so um, uh, as I mentioned, I live in Easton, and we'll, we've seen a couple maps of Eastern Shore. My service area extends from Cambridge all the way to Ocean City, and so folks know who their extension agents are in their communities. They know who they can go talk to. I do my best to learn what resources are available at the county, state, and federal level, and I do my best to understand what the needs are on the ground so that I can help let the two, just as Christy mentioned in um, with her number seven point about trying to integrate resources with needs and make sure that those are being met. So within Sea Grant Extension, this is the list of the different types of efforts that, that the Sea Grant Extension program undertakes. There are about, <coughs> between full and part-time people, about 500 folks in the state of Maryland who work for Extension. There are about 12 or 15 of us on the ground doing Sea Grant Extension work. <coughs> I'm gonna focus mostly on our coastal planning, land use, and water and watersheds issues, because that's what I do. Um, so the program I work in is watershed protection and restoration, and generally the goal is to help anybody to find ways to implement projects on the ground. So this might be a rain garden, a stormwater management facility, it might be tree plantings, but the point is to help improve water quality locally and as a result in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, there are, as I mentioned, not that many of us doing this work for Sea Grant Extension, but we're constantly growing. Um, as you can see, I'm down here on the Lower Eastern Shore, and we have, have colleagues who work all over the state, with the exception of the far western part of the state. Not that there aren't watersheds out there, but this started as a Chesapeake Bay focused effort, and um, those states in the western part, or those counties in the western part of the state, contribute less in terms of water quality impairments to the bay. So the list on the left are all the things that we try to understand about what the challenges and the issues are. So, so as extension agents, we learn the science. Um, we try to understand what best management practices exist to help communities mitigate their impacts on water quality. We learn about what grants are available for communities or local governments or watershed groups. Who else is providing these services? Where are there gaps in, say, contractors who could actually develop these practices or facilitators or community coaches? Um, what are the trends occurring? So, so we, we look at the research that Frederica presented to understand what's going on nationally, how's that translating locally, and then we do our best to connect with the research that's going on, not just at College Park or University of Maryland Eastern Shore, but around the country to understand, as I mentioned, what the trends are. Our clients are on the right, and basically it's anybody who, who wants help from us, which sometimes makes it difficult to triage. Um, we're not very good at saying no, but unfortunately what that means is that we end up spreading ourselves a little too thin. So we do our best to help our communities, but sometimes get a little overwhelmed. Um, there are a lot of groups that have sprung up in the last 10 to 15 years that are formed around a particular watershed or a river association, and they started because they felt there wasn't enough attention being paid to improving water quality. But these groups have grown and they're much more sophisticated and now they're starting to focus on these important issues like community resilience, environmental justice, community health. We uh, provide non-formal education, so we have teaching obligations. We work in the community to help translate that science to teach folks how to do practices and improve their lives. And ultimately, we're looking for behavior change. How can we change behavior to mitigate our impacts on water quality, but also to understand how we as a community can work together. So another piece of my work, which is sort of unique because my other colleagues, uh, the other four folks, don't really have a community development piece per se, although the work of extension is generally community development, uh, just on the face of it. But another piece of my work that I'm really interested in is uh, strategic planning and community visioning and community engagement. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the community visioning piece. And really, this is a way of bringing the 
science that Frederica presented and the knowledge that and the knowledge and science that Christy presented about how communities interact with one another and their communication pathways, what their networks look like. It's a way of bringing all that information together to allow for these communities to plan for their best future. So community visioning is just one tool that we can use to bring a community together. And it's basically like a strategic plan for a community. So we are giving communities access to resources. As Christy mentioned, there were, was a lot of concern in the community that she worked with that while there were resources available, they were confusing, which is what everyone feels. It's not just Christy's communities. <laughs> um, just try to navigate a state agency website and uh, you will quickly turn it off because it's not, it's not intuitive. Um, so that's a lot of the work that we try to do as well. So helping translate what resources are available to communities who are in need. So generally this is the process, what, what you would do if you were going to be doing community visioning. You would understand, as, as Christy has done, what are the assets in the community? What are the community's values? They are very, the, the communities Christy worked with are very focused on a faith-based um, way of congregating. And so let's understand that, let's meet them where they are and figure out how we can bring resources to them within that framework. Um, then we work, then we do the work that, Fred, that Frederica has done. We, un, we understand what's gone on in the past. What are the trends that we can look forward to based on what the science has done? And so once we understand that, how can we present some future scenarios to this community to say, this is what it's going to look like. It might be a one foot, three foot, five foot sea level rise. What can we conceivably plan for? What would you as a community like to do? Is relocation something that is what the community wants to do? Or do you want to stay and figure out how we can adapt in place? And we use the, the values of the community and the assets they have. So not everybody has the Warren Buffett budget to be able to say, yeah, we're going to stay in place. So we're going to build a 50 foot wall and there'll be a, a floodgate that we can you know, open up and close. And, and every community will have access to all these resources. As Frederica said, we are resilient, but we're not um, endlessly wealthy. So there will have to be a lot of decisions made. And the more we can empower these communities, and especially underserved communities, who, as Christy mentioned, are often in these marginal lands, these um, lands more prone to flooding, because during our times of segregation and racism, that was where those communities were put, because nobody wanted that land anyway. So we need to make sure that these resources that are available to communities to help them plan for the future are available to all segments of the community. So we take the values and the assets and we figure out what's the best future that we can plan for ourselves. And then we start to plan it, but that's not the end. We have to implement these practices. We have to evaluate what's going on. We have to always be checking to make sure that the community voices are being heard. Identify responsible parties. How many times have you gone to a meeting and someone says, we should do this, and then no one's assigned to it, and then nothing happens. So making sure that there are people on the hook for getting these actions done. So this is generally a process for community visioning. I didn't invent the process. I wish I could take credit for it because it seems pretty logical and wise to me. But this is generally how you might go about engaging with a community to pull in resources and help them with the future. But there are challenges to this process. So one thing might be that once the community came together, the elected leadership didn't want to follow what the community came up with. And so you have a, a mismatch between what the community is saying and what the leadership wants. There might be community members who don't trust each other. As Shikobi mentioned this morning, there's a lot of challenges in terms of justice and equality in this country right now. There's a lot of distrust. Um, there might have been conflicts that prevented people from even engaging with one another in a civil manner. And then what we're here to focus on today is figuring out how we can make sure all voices and interests are represented. And so um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about that and then we can open it up for questions. So how do we go about building this capacity for inclusion? And I, I read an article several weeks ago, I don't remember who said it or where it was, but I liked the quote which was, um, Diversity is having a voice, inclusion is having a seat at the table. So we aren't just focusing on making sure we've ticked all the boxes and made sure all the different diverse viewpoints are there. We want to make sure we're hearing and absorbing and listening and adapting when we focus on, on inclusion. 
So what are our best practices? You have to have an engaged community, and it has to be all members of the community. So key leaders are very important. You cannot leave a sector out of your community visioning process, or it just will not work. There will be different segments of the community at odds with one another. And I'll talk a little bit more in the next slide about some practices to ensure that that happens. You need a neutral facilitator. If you can't trust the person guiding the process, it's not going to happen. And that is something that I work very hard to do, to be a neutral facilitator in the community so that people know they can trust me to direct them to resources that I'm not playing for someone else's team that they don't trust. Um, you may need to do some capacity building for leadership. Bringing people from all different walks of life and places together into one room, not everybody is going to communicate the same way. Not everyone has had the same access to leadership opportunities and resources. Providing this group with some basic level of leadership capacity building empowers them to feel like they can contribute and their contributions will be valued. Take a look at all of the challenges. Yes, while we're focusing on environmental justice and sea level rise and climate change, there are challenges like poverty and lack of access to healthy food that are way more important on a daily basis to some of our community members than the rising seas that 2050 is a, a year that we can't even put our finger on. I don't know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. I'm pretty sure I don't know what I'm going to be doing in 2050. What do I do a lot? So, so I don't know how, how I'm going to be able to react to 2050. So I need to understand what are these other challenges my community is facing. It also makes a lot of sense as a facilitator or as someone who's working in this process to understand the needs of your community members. That makes you more relevant, it makes you more accessible, and it, it ensures a more robust product at the end. We need to institutionalize our outreach to underserved communities. It can't just be the 15 of us in the room being that squeaky wheel saying, don't forget about these other communities, don't forget about these community leaders. That needs to be a part of the fabric of how we exist as a community. It can't just be like, oh good, we were really diverse this time. You know, maybe next time we won't be, but that's okay, we tried. Um, and, and, and a communication plan. I recently went through an 18 month strategic planning process with colleagues with an extension. And we spent the first three months figuring out how we all worked, how we all communicated, how we could work together. You have to agree on how you're going to communicate and, and agree on your language. And we don't all speak the same language, so understanding that. And as I mentioned, listen, adapt, evaluate. This is an iterative process that keeps going. To, to, to build that uh, steering committee of key leaders, you really need to understand not just who the people are, but who their networks are. So understanding that while the four of you may exist here as a group, you may have networks that you can go back to, that you can draw resources from, that are influencing how you how you act. So there's lots of small scale, low tech ways that we can do that. Sticky notes, you know, lines that draw people to different networks, um, mind mapping where you just think about all the connections you have, the groups you belong to, the churches, the volunteer groups. And you look and see who, who, what networks are where. And in that way, you can build a more robust steering committee. Um, there's another technique called snowball interviewing. So I go and I talk to Crystal, and I say, Crystal, who should I interview? And she tells me to go talk to Christy. And it's Christy the same thing. And she tells me four more people. And so in that way, I may have never been in that community before. Chances are I haven't. But now I'm getting to know who the networks are and who I should talk to. It's not just one person telling me, talk to these five people and then you'll have your finger on the pulse. You're really trying to dig down to where, where people are. Again, utilize these communication hubs. Not everybody is on all kinds of social media. I worked with a community once where the way they communicated was the bulletin board in the town clerk's office. And it wasn't, wasn't a big community, so everybody got their information when they came in to pay their bill. And that was the only way everybody a Facebook team would have been useless. It wasted time. No one would have accessed their resources. Understanding how people communicate. And then consider who's affected. So you might have people at the table. There's a lot more people out there who are feeling the effects, as Christy mentioned. There's disproportionate numbers of people being affected by these problems that haven't actually caused them and may not know how to engage. So when you're building this committee, this steering group, consider not just who 
the, the leaders are, the voices can pipe up, but who's affected? And then figure out how you can find a leader in that community as well. And this is my last slide, so I've gone over a few minutes. But um, So this is my sort of vision for how this would work. So we're looking at climate change as the science, the sea level rise, the, the um, land subsidence, the inundation. And we're also looking at community values. What, what does this community value about how they exist as a community? It is an organism, even though you can't put your arms around it. How can we make sure we have all folks engaged in these communities? And then how do we help them plan for their best future? I, I think that the ways that I've outlined are my vision for creating my program on the Eastern Shore for helping some of these communities. And I'm trying to piggyback on a lot of the research that's already been done in a few of those communities, and I'm working to identify more as well. So if you're interested in work on the Lower Eastern Shore, please get involved. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sure, don't mind. So if you have questions, please, for those who weren't here earlier, state your name, your affiliation, and your question. So does anyone have any questions? None? Okay, I guess I will <laughs> reports 
on, uh, on the process, but then also on those obstacles that came up, and then it, it talks a little bit more about some of the opportunities for, for increasing justice. And one of those reports is going to be distributed to um, policymakers of Maryland at the county and the state level and to um, environmental organizations. And then the other one will go to the African American churches. And they have different, uh, they're similar, but the reports differ in the opportunities that are highlighted because the churches have different capacities than sort of the policy makers. So that's, that's one um, way that I'm hoping to share those results. Uh, then, you know, I'm working on writing my dissertation and, and hope to do some um, publishing in, in scientific journals, but that's relatively inaccessible for a lot of these communities. And so I've, throughout this process, I've tried to uh, write letters to the pastors or to uh, leaders in the church to sort of say where the research is, highlight some of the findings, and, and keep them updated um, on, on the progress. You raise a good point. I mean, one of the real challenges here is how do we sustain something that Christy started? Or how do you sustain the engagement with the community when you started to build the network? And for us in the academic circles, it's a little, you know, we go, not the academic circles, it's any circles. You sort of go from one funding cycle to another, one grant from another. And, and it's a, um, it's, it's an unsustainable model for maintaining uh, and building community networks and making those networks effective. And I think that people who don't want those networks to be effective know that that will happen and that they make use of that. And so I think that's an important discussion that I think lots of people are having, but it's a problem we have to solve. And as we're looking ahead at, at these climate adaptations, this is, we're in this for the really long haul, so we better start figuring out um, mechanisms by which we can keep individual communities engaged. I mean, the problem here is that there's going to be a lot of social unrest when people's houses are starting to seriously go into the water. And so we got 20 years to get it together, and we better start doing that. Um, and, and that's a real problem because Christie's work's incredible, but her funding's done. She's finished her dissertation. How do we maintain it? Right. So. Um, I'm sorry, your name. George Dickendorf. I'm at Howard University. I'm an ecologist, and one of the things that the Ecological Society is doing is having its meeting in Baltimore. And so I would um, ask that you get in touch with me um, sure. because I think your talk would be great there. Because one of the things we're talking about is environmental justice, working with communities, and it, it's spot on. But my point here is that Ecological Society developed some years ago, along with AAAS, a rapid response series of scientists. Uh, 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 a network of scientists who can respond to catastrophic, catastrophic events, hurricanes, floods, etc., and provide information. And at the time that was being built, I suggested that what we needed was a not so rapid response team. A, 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 a team of scientists who would commit to working with communities for long periods of time, regardless of funding cycle and, and availability. And so it would really be an involvement of and creating sets of networks of local scientists in local regions. Regardless of where they did their research, they would always be available to the local community. And I think this is something that certainly you can do here in Maryland on a local basis and use that as a model for reaching out. And I think working with extension services, but also going beyond the extension services associated with universities, to work with private schools and colleges like Howard University or the university or, or any other local university that set up some sort of interconnected network that would allow communities to reach out. And I suspect that some of it could be done through the internet, at least setting up um, and, and providing community engagement opportunities with scientists and academics. Yeah, it, to some extent though, there are you know, big portions of the Eastern Shore that don't have high-speed internet. And so uh, for some of these communities, that would, that would be a challenge. It's also just basically challenging to get people to drive over to the Eastern Shore. I mean, I have a hard time getting researchers to come past Cambridge because it's, you know, not here. And so <laughs> there are other universities that are not College Park, yes, that we can engage with, but when it gets down to it, uh, those trips cost money. 
those researchers have funds in their grants that are for attending large conferences and publications and not for traveling to communities that may not get them the accolades they need for the academic process and what the academic process values. I'm not saying that um, this won't happen, but I'm just telling you these are some of the challenges that, that we face when we're literally on the ground just trying to get folks there's a lot of information out there and not that many extension agents and, and now there's a hiring freeze. So <laughs> So it's all another Chesapeake biology. So one thing that struck me in both of the presentations this effort on community engagement and bringing state and perhaps even in other cases federal agencies the focus was on getting the community to the just as much work get the agency engaged. So, so what are the approaches for that? Because the snowball in interviewing the working through the churches isn't going to work for the agencies, which I think it's got a great website. But as you said, for many of the people you're wanting to reach, having a great website is meaningless because they can't have access. Well, I'll talk a little bit about the work that we've done in Sea Grant Extension, we've created this watershed assistance collaborative to, to try to break down those barriers. And so just as working in a community, from, from my experience, just as working in a community is about building relationships with community leaders and community members, there are relationships I have to build with state agency people uh, to, to make sure that I know the right person to go to say, all right, this is the next person to go to. Here's the way around the red tape. Here's the way through the website. Um, and we've had some success with that through some state level um, funding opportunities like the trust fund, the, the Chesapeake Bay Trust is now moving into more environmental justice, environmental health uh, funding projects. But you're right, it's, it's a one at a time, understanding what resources are there, making a cold call, talking to a person. It's literally just connecting people to people. And, and you're right, that takes a lot of effort. But Tom, I also think the interesting part of that is, is how we appreciate knowledge and who presents brings knowledge to the table. And as long as we remain in a hierarchical form on knowledge sharing, we're not going to really get anywhere. And there's pretty significant data to show that. And you know that from working with um, uh, collaborative um, operations, uh, collaborative um, conversations to resolve fishing issues and that and I think that that's a real interest of all of ours is how do you take how do you bring everybody into the room and recognize the um, the even distribution of knowledge availability and that and, and as long as it remains this uh, uh, a, a higher article you're going to have real problems getting anywhere and I think that that's and Christie's research has really shown that too I mean you're uh, access to, there are barriers that have existed for a long time and that, um, and that changing that sort of access has to change the knowledge, the way we're sharing knowledge. And the amount of knowledge that people have in rural communities about how to deal with living with the, their ecosystem, basically, is um, impressive and not to be disregarded. If I can share just a brief anecdote that illustrates that, uh, I was uh, attending a, a meeting of uh, different environmental organizations and that were focusing on adaptation of, of Dorchester County to sea level rise, uh, focusing on the wetlands. You know, how are we going to preserve bird habitat and wildlife habitat and allow these uh, wetlands to continue existing? And one of their main adaptation strategies is that they wanted to encourage farmers in the area to. Um, switch over to growing switchgrass, which can, um, which allows for some flooding to happen on their farmland so they don't barricade their farmland, but it's, it's more conducive to allowing those wetlands and those bird species to thrive. Um, and so I'm sitting at this meeting with these different uh, environmental planners and sitting beside me um, with someone who was associated with one of these groups. He also lived in the county and was a farmer. He leaned over to me and said, that's never going to work here. No one's going to do that. 
And then I, I, I thought, here he is right at the table. He is a farmer doing this work. And, and not once did, did the scientists in the room turn to him and say, what do you think is this going to work? And then there was a bunch of conversation about, we need to engage with the community. How can we do that? Not once did people turn to him and say, can we have a barbecue with your friends? Can you help? So I think, I think it's what Frederick was saying, that there are these um, boundaries around what kind of knowledge is appropriate to employ. And experiential knowledge within the community just isn't, um, it doesn't fit the mold. And it's, it's maybe not that it's not valued, but uh, it's, scientists are maybe uncomfortable interacting with them. And so figuring out how to. Or greatly for I would, I would also add, I've been doing this work for five or six years now, and the, there's two parts to my job. I understand what the needs are on the ground, understand what resources are available, and try to link the two. The easier part of my job is telling the folks on the ground what resources are available. The harder part that I still haven't had success at, you know, as you point out, is saying to the resource people, your program doesn't fit needs are on the ground. It needs to be tweaked 90 degrees in order to fit with these communities that you think you're targeting. And there are so many bureaucratic hierarchical constraints that go all the way up to the highest levels that the program can't be shifted. It's a one size fits all. This is the issue of the day. Quick, let's scramble together a program. Now everybody needs to do X. And it doesn't match what the needs on the ground are. And so. There's a, a, a small but dedicated army of people trying to, you know, move that, shift that um, system. But, but you're right. That is the bigger challenge, and I don't have an answer, a simple answer to solve it. Well, I hate to cut the conversation oh, right into the break. Um, I'd just like to say to thank all of you, Frederick, uh, and Christine, and Jennifer, um, for being here and treating this. And thank all of you for being here today and participating. If you have any additional questions, do please feel free to reach out to them and make contacts that way that we can, like you say, fill that void and select resources and information to each other. Um, and with that, please feel free to continue.